Hello everyone, my name is Emily and this is the eighth episode of the Reading Buddy Book Club for July where we are reading Race to the Bottom of the Sea. We are getting very close to the end of this book and things are starting to heat up. So before we get started, make sure you have your reading buddy and get comfy. If you want a snack or a drink, make sure you've got that. Find a good place to sit. If you haven't finished those coloring pages or those crafts, go ahead and keep working on those. Or if you'd prefer, you can go ahead and follow along as I read. And let's get started. The stench of death was thick in the air as we approached the carcass. There, a mere mile off the mainland coast, a sperm whale floated, belly up, its ventral grooves black with decay. We circled the whale, and then we saw the sharks, at least six of them, four great whites and two tigers, moving in to tear chunks of meat from the whale, as casually as if they were dining at a local buffet. Their teeth grappled the whale expertly, their jaws working with a thousand pounds per square inch of pressure, their bodies violently shaking the flesh loose, a display to birth a thousand nightmares but also a testament to nature's great cycle of life. A whale dies, the sharks feast, an apple is eaten, its core discarded, a bird plucks out the seeds, a tree's leaves fall and rot. The nutrients released provide sustenance for an entire forest of trees. In nature, death not only makes way for life, it fosters life. The death of things that come before us is the only reason any of us receives a turn on this planet in the first place. Exploring an Underwater Fairyland by Dr. and Dr. Quayle. Chapter 24 Fidelia stared up at the ceiling. The beams of the mother dog were impeccable. No slivers, no wood rot, no termites. As if the oak trees had grown branches already sanded and shaped. Her mind felt too tangled to sleep, her heart too wounded. Merrick was finally caught. Logically, she knew he was dying anyway. He'd signed his death sentence when he went into the cave of the Red Daisies. What difference did it make whether he was hanged by Admiral Bridgewater or blown up with the jewel or left to wheeze and cough and sputter while his lungs slowly collapsed? But it did make a difference, Fidelia knew. It made a difference whether a great shark was reeled in or left to fight and lose its battle out in open waters. And what about Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody L? Admiral Bridgewater would hang them, too, without a doubt. So much unnecessary death. Her adventure was over. She, too, was being hauled back like a fish on a barbed line. And after everything that had happened over the last week, nothing had really changed. Her parents were still gone. Grizzle was still untagged. Aunt Julia was waiting in Arborly with her books and her turtle soup. And they would still be moving to the mainland. She still buzzed with questions unanswered. Why did Merrick send Fidelia into shark-infested waters just to see an old brooch one more time? And for that matter, why did he search through the deadly cave in the first place? What was the brooch for, really? And what would happen to it when the Admiral inevitably found it? Long after the lamps had been extinguished, Fidelia resisted closing her eyes, certain it would be a sleepless night for her but her eyelids grew droopy in the darkness, so she rolled over onto her side and slept, dreamlessly and silently. Sometime in the night, she was suddenly awake. The bell must have rung, signaling the change of the watch. Or perhaps the ship had rocked, or it didn't matter. She was up now, and she knew what she had to do. She threw her covers off and shivered. The air was crisper, chillier than the muggy tropical counterpart. They were back on the cocoa route, on their way to Arborly, to the gallows. She tiptoed, the boards cold beneath her stocking feet, up to the quarter deck. A line of marines stood along the railing, keeping guard, and Fidelia approached them, flushing her stomach. The Admiral told you to stay in your cabin, one of the men barked at her. I know, it's just, I think I'm going to be sick. She put a wasted look on her face and gagged, then rushed between two of the men and leaned over the railing, heaving dramatically. Don't you get that on any of the boards, one of the men said. You make sure you pitch it way out. At last, she stood up, wiping the back of her mouth delicately. That's better. 
She sucked air through her nose with a little quiver. I'm sure I cleared the ship. As expected, the guards dashed forward to inspect the side of the ship. Admiral Bridgewater would no doubt blame them if even a drip of vomit hit the mother dog. When their backs were turned, Fidelia carefully plucked a set of keys from one officer's waist and sneaked to the hatch, lifting it slowly. It was a dark, damp space. Creaks from the deck above echoed through the hollows of the ship. The ocean pounded against the sides in muffled rhythm. Fidelia had to duck to avoid hitting her head on the ceiling. At first, nothing. Just the scratching of rats. Then something moved in the shadows. Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody L sat on the benches in their cells. Water sloshed around their ankles. Bloody L snoozed. Cheap Shot Charlie nudged her gently and said, We've got a visitor. And the visitor has a gift. Fidelia glanced behind her, just to be sure she hadn't been followed, and pulled the set of keys from her dress. How did you... Bloody L said, and Fidelia smiled. You three have been a bad influence on me. She unlocked their cell doors and uncuffed them. Where is he? Bloody L rubbed her sore wrists, then pointed to the farthest corner of the hold. Merrick, Fidelia inched forward until she found him, and her breath abandoned her. He was cuffed to the wall, his wrists feet, and neck were all enclosed by tight metal hoops and linked by a heavy chain to the ship's boards. A sort of steel cage was fixed over his head and around his mouth, a muzzle. Admiral Bridgewater was either afraid Merrick would talk his way to freedom with his clever words, or he was tired of Merrick's insults, or both. Merrick was slumped against the wall, his labored breathing audible even over the hold's noisy groans and shudders. He coughed every few seconds, an awful grating sound. Fidelia's stomach clenched at the sight of him, shackled, exhausted, defeated. Merrick, she said. He didn't even look up. His chin stayed tucked to his chest, coughing, sniffling, breathing that rattly breath. She unlocked his cell and stood beside him, waiting for him to expose his cuffs so she could free him. Lean forward, Captain, Bloody L said. But Merrick didn't move, or make any indication that he'd even heard them. Fidelia looked at Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody L. What's wrong with him? She whispered, her voice weak. Why won't he let me unlock him? Merrick slowly angled his head up and coughed, and Fidelia winced at his black and red eye, swollen and black as ever, leaking some darkish fluid down his cheek. Cheap Shot Charlie studied his captain. He's not coming, he finally surmised. Merrick coughed, his whole body straining, chains jangling, blood spraying through the bars of his muzzle. For a moment, Fidelia thought, this is it, his last breath. But Merrick somehow found his air and then dropped his head again. No, hot tears stung Fidelia's eyes. No, you can't just surrender like this. You're Merrick the Monstrous. You always escape. Do your disappearing act before Bridgewater hangs you. But with every shaky inhale Merrick took, it was confirmed the pirate captain was all but finished. He'd never survive an escape. He'd never be able to swim away, and Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody L were in no shape to tow him to land. They were both weak from their all-sweets diet, drained from the tussle with the Navy, and Charlie's leg wound was festering with pus and crusted blood. It would be a miracle if the two of them made it to safety. Was Merrick trying to speak? Fidelia couldn't tell. His jaw muscles were blocked by the iron gate of the muzzle. Go, he croaked. Bloody L dropped to her knees and gripped Merrick's skeletal hands. Captain, but there was nothing more to say. If Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody L had any chance of escaping, they'd have to leave Merrick behind. Merrick raised his head again and met the faces of his crew, his two best mates, the ones who had survived by his side, slowly, so painfully slowly, he nodded. It was all the answer Bloody L and Cheap Shot Charlie needed. You have to hurry. They'll know I'm out of my bunk any minute. Fidelia could barely stand it, the heaviness of this moment, the agony. Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody L slipped up to the ladder in silence, off to hide themselves somewhere on the massive flagship until the opportune time to jump. No goodbyes, no hugs, no final message to their captain or their captive. 
Fidelia needed to get back to her bunk before the Admiral was alerted, but she couldn't make herself care. What did it matter if they caught her? She couldn't save Merrick. Just like when her parents died, she was helpless against the ebbs and flows of life, the triumphs and the losses. Creatures were born and played their part in the great ecosystem. The triumphs and the losses. Creatures were born and played their part in the great ecosystem, and then they died. And there was nothing she could do to stop it. She swiveled around and marched to the ladder. She had to get back to her bed so she could pretend to be waking at dawn. So she could feign innocence when the officers realized Bloody L and Cheap Shot Charlie weren't in their cells. So she could act like everything was fine. Quail. The moan was barely detectable among Merrick's strained breaths. Thank you. Thank you? For what? For retrieving his brooch? Well, he had forced her taken her away from Arborly, sailed her across the world, threatened her with all manner of violence if she refused to complete the task, but he hadn't made her care. No pirate on earth could have forced such a thing, not with a thousand pistols. Her tears spilled over as she climbed the ladder, no sign of Cheap Shot Charlie or Bloody L on the deck. Perhaps they'd already dived overboard, or perhaps they'd hidden safely out of sight, waiting until the opportune moment to make their getaway. Either way, she wished on every swell of the sea that they would make it. Soundlessly, she replaced the hatch to the hold and then threw the set of keys overboard. And when she climbed back into her bed, she stared at the ceiling until morning. Chapter 25, 20 knots. That's what the jewel could do back in her heyday, so said Cheap Shot Charlie. The mother dog could barely reach 12 knots. She was much too big to be as nimble as the jewel. But she made up for her lethargy with sheer gusto. Goose pimples broke out on Fidelia's arms with every swell, but the ship powered through any thread of storm with the strength of ten blue whales. Still, slow as she was, the mother dog was flying, making record time. The crosswinds, Fidelia realized, were almost non-existent. The undertow was not only sparing them its chaos, it was actually pushing them back to Arborly. Too fast, Fidelia wanted to cry to the wind and the waves. Slow this down. Make it last. These are Merrick's final moments. Stretch them out. But on they sailed, and by the afternoon of the second day, the mother dog cruised past the quarrel of the damned without fanfare or ritual. Fidelia, seeing the red fringes poking up out of the water from the porthole in her bunk, closed her eyes and hummed a tuneless three-note song, and she didn't open her eyes again for a long time. The officers had discovered that two of their four prisoners were missing. Fidelia counted herself in the group, because although she wasn't cuffed in the leaky hold, she was no longer allowed to leave her quarters. Admiral Bridgewater sent some of his men out in longboats to scan the ship's surroundings for any clue to their whereabouts, but to no avail. The pirates were gone. On the evening of the third day, an officer came to Fidelia's bunk. The Admiral wants to see you. An order, not a request. Admiral Bridgewater's cabin was spacious, larger than Aunt Julia's loft at Arborley Library. Fidelia took a seat at an elaborately carved table that seated twelve, a war table, for plotting battles, she figured. How many plans to catch Merrick were made at this very table, only to be thwarted on the seas? Silhouetted by the bay window, the Admiral stood across from her. His uniform jacket was currently being ironed and starched by a sailor in the corner. Instead, he had donned a burgundy velvet smoking jacket and lounging cap. I am trying, Admiral Bridgewater said, to get an exact accounting of what happened to you. He walked to his drinking cart and poured himself a glass of spirits, then sipped it with a grimace as if it were a tonic. Let me guess what happened here, he said as he circled the long table. Merrick took you against your will. He brought you to his cave, and he would have made you fetch his treasure for him if we hadn't shown up and saved you. His piggy eyes were squinted, focusing on Fidelia as if she were a very small, indecipherable treasure map. Is that accurate? How could she possibly explain to Admiral Bridgewater that it was all a bit blurrier than that? Yes, there were pistols in her face when the pirates came to the Quail family home. 
pistols that motivated her to board the jewel and do as Merrick said. She'd believed him when he said he'd hurt her. He was Merrick the Monstrous, after all. Yes, it was easy to measure a beast by the size of his teeth and the power of his jaws, but there was more to a beast than just his bite. And somewhere along the way, things with Merrick had shifted. She'd wanted to help Merrick, to grant this dying man his last request, even though it meant risking her own life. Yes, Fidelia answered honestly, but... What doesn't make sense, Admiral Bridgewater went on, is why a victim of Merrick the Monstrous would be so distraught when we finally caught and bound her captor. Am I mistaken, or did I see tears when the jewel sank? He sneered and smoothed his velvet lapel. And then there is the matter of the missing prisoners. Two of my men reported seeing you on deck, in direct violation of your orders to remain in your cabin. On the very night, the pirates escaped. The coincidence is rather remarkable, isn't it? His smile was terrible, pompous as one of the medals on his uniform. A victim of Merrick's will be returned safely home and given Her Majesty's guarantee that the vermin will hang until dead. He swished his glass of spirits so the ice clinked against the sides. But his accomplices, he continued, will swing next to him. His stench of alcohol and body odor soured Fidelia's nostrils as he stepped even closer. So what are you? Admiral Bridgewater enclosed her with his shadow. Are you one of Merrick the Monstrous's unfortunate pawns? Or were you a willing participant? The right answer was obvious. All she had to do was condemn Merrick, disintegrate into tears of relief at being rescued, and recap the nightmare she'd had, spending those days on the jewel in terror with the outlaws. All she had to do was name Merrick for the devil he was, and the Admiral would be satisfied. She looked into Admiral Bridgewater's face. There, between the jowls and the scorn, she saw it. Fear. A fear she recognized, that fear you get when something massive is dangling on your line, and you'll do anything to reel it in, and you're scared you'll lose the biggest catch of your life. Admiral Bridgewater had Merrick. He had Merrick's great treasure, and he'd do anything to reel this in all the way. So why couldn't she do it? Why couldn't she give the Admiral the answer he was looking for? Admiral Bridgewater watched her flail, scrunching his face. Did you know that Merrick was in the Navy? She nodded slowly, wary of a trap. Do you know how he left? Admiral Bridgewater stroked his mustache and took a seat right next to Fidelia. She could smell the sharpness of his cologne, the sweat between his chins. Merrick was top of his class, the best gunfighter we've ever had, a pro with schematics and navigation, a master sailor. But even more than that, he was a thinker. He devised ways out of battles that didn't require a single cannon fired. A mind like that, I thought, will spoil faster than Mulvanian goats' milk if we don't channel it. And so Merrick was on track to being the youngest vice admiral in the history of the Queen's own navy. Yes, that sounded like Merrick. A man who hid his beloved ship in a lake knew how to think sideways, how to come up with plan Z when plans A, B, and C were ruined. I knew, of course, how bright he was, but I had no idea the things he was truly capable of. The horrible things. I should have seen it. I should have put out that twinkle in his eyes, wiped away that laugh in the corner of his mouth. I should have stopped him. Admiral Bridgewater sipped the melted ice in his glass. I have caught and hung the most notorious pirates to ever sail the nine seas, the Admiral said, but I have never seen a monster like Merrick. He didn't just abandon rank and leave the base as any decent officer would have done. No, he had to make a grand exit. He and that, that fiend, Charlie, they took one of the frigates one night and threw its crew overboard. They set off explosions all along the fort. Those who weren't blown completely into pieces had to search for their own legs among the debris. Fidelia shuddered. 
She shouldn't be surprised. She knew Merrick's legacy. She knew how monstrous he was. And yet she'd seen it in his one remaining eye, a shred of humanity. There was sadness there, deep abiding sadness and immeasurable gratitude when she brought him that brooch. It didn't excuse what he'd done, of course it didn't, but it made it impossible for her to write him off as simply a monster. So please believe me, the Admiral finished, when I say you are lucky to be alive. You are lucky to be in one piece, and whatever sympathy you may have for this, this animal, well, toss it overboard where it belongs. Chapter 26 Arborly Island. Smog hung thicker than she remembered, and the plants seemed yellowed and dried compared to the lush green fronds in the tropics. Everything about the island looked stale, bleached, sad. The mother dog made berth at the main wharf, and the officers exited the ship in rank, the seamen first, the warrant officers, then the lieutenants. A lieutenant strong-armed Fidelia off the ship and took her to a bench on the on the boardwalk. They wrapped a scratchy, cordless, navy-issue blanket around her, as if she, and not Merrick, were the one infirmed. Admiral Bridgewater came down the mother dog's gangplank, his beady red eyes scanning Stony Beach as if he expected a royally commissioned parade to greet him and celebrate his victory. But the beach was empty. Bring him out, he ordered. They dragged Merrick out of the hold, completely uncuffed. The thirty marines' bayonets aimed at his head were more than enough to keep him tethered. Fidelia winced at the sight of him. He shivered and coughed, soaking wet and stinking so bad of mildew that she could smell him from where she sat. The officers marched him down the gangplank, then dropped him onto the shingle beach like a half-drowned rodent. His arms were yanked out of his peacoat. His shirt was peeled from his body. The faded tattoo of a red daisy stained Merrick's sunken chest, just above his heart, his ribcage visible enough to play like an instrument. The hardened purple veins in his hands had spread, web-like, up his arms, into his knotty back, and onto his neck. He crumbled, a shower of bloody phlegm coating the pebbles under him, and he balled his fist from the pain. In one of those hands, Fidelia realized, Merrick still has the brooch. Merrick von Morn, announced Bridgewater. You are convicted, again, of piracy, evasion of the Navy, and the kidnapping of a minor. All are capital crimes under Her Majesty's rule. You are hereby sentenced to hang by the neck until dead. Or until you blink, Merrick wheezed. Admiral Bridgewater strode closer to Merrick, until the pirate captain's face was mere inches from the admiral's well-polished boots. The admiral lowered his voice. Legally, I have to hang you. The queen prefers that enemies of her kingdom have public deaths. But when you attempt whatever hack need escape your planning, here the admiral leaned down close to Merrick's ear, which Fidelia noticed. Her gut twisting was also bleeding. I will be the one to shoot you. Merrick raised his head looking forward to it. The pirate stared, his two-toned eyes firing holes into the admiral, but just when Fidelia was bracing for the admiral to throw punches, Merrick coughed. He coughed right into Admiral Bridgewater's face, and red spittle clung to the admiral's mustache like raindrops. Admiral Bridgewater pulled one of his white gloves off and wiped his mustache clean. You hang at dawn, he said and then I'm finally free of your black soul. A nod from the Admiral and the brutes in silver buttons swept Merrick down the boardwalk, into the cobbled street and out of sight. They were taking him to a holding cell, an iron box where he'd wait for death. And this time, Fidelia knew, death would find him. Whether Merrick truly could make a grand escape from the noose or whether he gasped his last breath in that cell, it didn't really matter. Merrick the Monstrous was done. Admiral Bridgewater went back to his ship, leaving a small group of marines to patrol the beach. Fidelia barely noticed them. She stayed huddled on the boardwalk. A soft rain fell. 
She rubbed her glasses dry on the hem of her dirty, threadbare dress and sniffed the ends of her hair. She positively reeked. Enough dirt coated her arms that she could have planted carrots. Aunt Julia would dunk her in a bath right away and pour that awful violet tonic all over her, if she even let Fidelia inside. Maybe she'd just make Fidelia wash off in the rain. Here she sat, again, staring out at Stony Beach, again. Just as she had done weeks ago, she'd sailed almost around the world, and she'd come back to see the same view. The undertow swirled just beyond the harbor, crackling, a stormy commander gathering troops for weathery destruction. Beneath the bridge, a canal boat approached, splashing grimy water onto a murder of crows congregating on the cobblestones. Fidelia barely noticed. She was too busy watching the waves in the bay go from ripples to mountains. Fidelia! At first, Fidelia thought it was the crows crying, the sound of it so inhuman. But when she turned, she saw a woman hobbling across the boardwalk. It took a moment to realize it was Aunt Julia. Her aunt was wearing the same beige dress she'd worn the day Fidelia was kidnapped, only it was covered in ink blots and tear stains and smudges from who knows what. And her hair, Aunt Julia's usually tight, perfect bun, was a gull's nest of greasy tendrils. She was a person undone. Fidelia got to her feet. Aunt Julia ran across the slats, the gap between them closing smaller and smaller until her aunt collided into her, clutching her so hard it felt like the wispy librarian might snap in two. Oh God, you're all right. Aunt Julia buried her face in that crook between Fidelia's neck and shoulder, muffling her words. Thank goodness, they told me, they told me you'd been taken by pirates, but you're all right. You're all right. Was Fidelia all right? I'm home now, Fidelia said, her words mechanical, stroking her aunt's back. Aunt Julia landed a kiss on Fidelia's forehead and searched her face. Fidelia, what happened? Aunt Julia, Fidelia croaked. The book. The book? Fidelia dropped the military blanket and pulled exploring an underwater fairyland out of her bag. Julia went pale as a turtle's egg. She opened the front cover, shuddering when she saw the stamp, property of Arborly Library. Aunt Julia took hold of her shoulders, her magnified doe's eyes blinking fiercely behind her peach spectacles. Tell me what happened, Fidelia. Tell me everything, right now. So there, on the boardwalk, rain pitter-pattering down onto their hair, Fidelia told Aunt Julia everything, a skeletal version. She told her aunt that she'd been taken by Merrick and Charlie and Elle, and when she said his name, Merrick the Monstrous, Aunt Julia closed her eyes and kept them closed for a full five seconds before she seemed ready to see the world again. What did he want? Aunt Julia's voice was strangled. Did he tell you why he took you? He needed me to get his treasure, Fidelia answered. Lost treasure from an underwater cave, from the Cave of the Red Daisies. Aunt Julia whispered. Her cheeks were gray. How did you know? Fidelia said. I'm a librarian. Aunt Julia shook all over. Did you go into the cave? Tell me now, Fidelia. Did you breathe in the pollen? She clamped Fidelia's wrist with cold, bloodless fingers. No, Fidelia managed and pulled her wrist free. No, the Navy came and they took it all in. Where is he now? Merrick the Monstrous. He's locked up somewhere. She didn't mention that Merrick was dying. She didn't mention that all he wanted from the bottom of the sea was some old pewter brooch. She didn't mention that watching him die was horrifying and would haunt her for the rest of her days, like seeing a fish drown on dry land. The Admiral is hanging him tomorrow morning. Her aunt bloomed red with anger. Good. Aunt Julia's teeth were clenched. Let him hang. She wiped her palms on her skirt. But Fidelia didn't know how to tell her aunt that there was a spark of humanity in Merrick, or there had been before the Admiral captured him, before he was muzzled and beaten and locked in the hold of the flagship. I don't think he should die like this. He kidnapped you, Aunt Julia said. He would have let you die, but he didn't, Fidelia said. He could have been so cruel. He could have kept me in ropes the whole journey. You could have held his gun to my head and made me dive into the cave. He could just let me breathe in the pollen, but he didn't. 
She glanced down at her boots. I know he's Merrick the Monstrous, but I don't think he's all bad. He's a pirate, Fidelia. There, there was a whiff of the stern Aunt Julia Fidelia had left behind. How could he possibly be anything but bad? Fidelia looked out over Stony Beach at the slate blue water folding over itself, the foam climbing the shore. There was so much still to tell, but she was out of strength, out of words. Aunt Julia reached over and tucked a strand of Fidelia's ragged hair behind her ear. Are you hungry? She finally said. Her aunt's hand lingered in her hair. Fidelia could feel the warmth of the familiar touch radiating through her entire being. That depends, she said with a weak grin. Are you cooking? Huzzah for Fidelia! The howling of the undertow was nothing compared to the storm inside the book and bottle. Fiddles whinnied and sailors sang and danced around the tables as Fidelia and Aunt Julia slurped their bowls of shipwreck stew. Shipwreck stew, hot and robust, a hundred flavors to decipher, lobster and little neck clams and tarragon and cod, and above all, the taste of familiar, the taste of home. This island isn't the same without a quail, old Ratface drained his fourth mug of ale and hiccuped. Long live the reigning quail, the pub chorused. Fidelia smiled at each of them, most already drunk and red-nosed. Some of the sailors gawked at her, as though they were looking at a ghost. Some regarded her with mugs raised, clearly impressed that she had endured Merrick the Monstrous and lived to tell the tale. And a few grinned stupidly, glad that she was back safely, no doubt, but also pleased to have an excuse for merriment. Then she thought of a few other faces missing from this circle. Ida's and Arthur's, yes, of course, yes, but also Bloody L. Her rough, tanned skin, her black ringed tattoos, her loyalty to her captain, her eagerness, and cheap shot Charlie, his long face and bald head and grouchy eyebrows and brambly disposition, his way of protecting his captain, Fidelia now understood, and Merrick, of course, his contrasting eyes, the piercing blue, for all of his cleverness and grit, and the black and red eye, a dead eye. She missed them all. Her chest suddenly gave a tremble. The celebration around her dimmed and muted itself. Everything was coming up fast, a rush of sky, as though she was surfacing too quickly from a deep sea dive. She'd survived a kidnapping, survived pirates, and not just any pirates, but the pirate, the most dangerous outlaw who had ever sailed. She'd survived the undertow again, survived a breakneck trip to the tropics, survived an encounter with the territorial shark, survived finishing the water eater, and she'd survived losing her parents. She'd folded herself in half over the table and buried her face in her hands and cried. Shh, Aunt Julia patted her back with soft hands. Let's get you home. Her whisper echoed far away to Fidelia. Aunt Julia led her out of the pub and into a canal boat, the sailors lining up to watch her leave like a processional. She managed to stay awake long enough to see Arborley Library, still massive, still beautiful. She managed to get out of the canal boat and up to the marble steps. Then Fidelia collapsed, the weight of the last few weeks, the last few months, making her too weak to stand. She felt Aunt Julia lift her. Small, wispy Aunt Julia carried her up three flights of stairs, tucked her into bed, and didn't let go of her hand until she fell asleep. Two years earlier. When they reached Medusa's Grotto, Merrick shut himself into his personal tunnel, the captain's quarters, and locked the door behind him. Bloody L and Cheap Shot Charlie kept busy. They cleaned their wounds from the Great Naval Massacre, bandaged cuts, repaired themselves as best as they could with the primitive first aid supplies they kept on the jewel. They scrubbed the ship of barnacles, refitted new wood along the boards, tarred the dry rot. They caught fish, grilled shrimp, and guzzled rum while staring silent at the fire in the sand pit. They slept, rose, and slept again. Merrick's store didn't budge. If he came out to find sustenance or drink, it was in the night, while his comrades were snoozing. He's been in there too long, Bloody L said after a week, her fingers following the lines of her wrist tattoos around and around. I'm breaking down the door. Cheapshot Charlie held his arm in front of her. He needs more time. 
He needs water, Bloody Owl cried, and food, and air. Cheapshot Charlie gripped her shoulders. He'll come out when he's ready, he said. I know Merrick. He loves to fight. The Wildswing stared at the door. But he also loves to brood. If we open this door next week and find a skeleton with one blue eye, I'm telling Merrick's ghost it's your fault, Bloody Owl grumbled. But she left the captain alone. Cheapshot Charlie, who had known Merrick for more than a decade, who had first met the ambitious glib pirate captain back when he was a fresh-faced, silver-button-wearing, goose-stepping member of the Queen's Own Navy. Cheapshot Charlie was right. One morning, when Bloody L and Cheapshot Charlie walked past the captain's quarters, the door was ajar. Their captain sat on the edge of the dock, his bare feet dangling in the water. Jellyfish swirled dangerously close, but didn't sting him, as if they sensed he'd been through enough. His greatcoat, once the pride of his wardrobe, black velvet lined with silk, white embroidered ivory along the collar, was flung over a post, ruined. He bought that coat after his first raid, a ceremonial purchase from a fur stall in Mulvania. And now the coat was trashed, tails tattered, embroidery unstitched and frayed, the lining stained with giant scorch marks from the admiral's cannons. Bloody Owl and Cheapshot Charlie approached their captain slowly. Wounded animals were often desperate enough to lash out for a last taste of blood in their final hours. Green legs, Merrick said after a moment. The great pirate. He skimmed his toes along the electric blue surface of the water. He died young, only 30 years old. I remember, Cheapshot Charlie said. Merrick continued. Iron Chest Shelley also died at 30 and Captain Walden and Crowfoot Callum died two weeks shy of his 30th birthday. And how did they all die? He didn't wait for them to answer. Swinging in the gibbets, wearing noose neckties, or shot down at sea by the Navy. He kicked a jellyfish who pulsed too close. All of them caught. What are you getting at, Captain? Cheapshot Charlie asked. Merrick finally glanced up, his cheeks gaunt, his good eye distant and cold. I'm 30 this year, he said. You're twice the pirate any of those others were, Bloody Owl said, even green legs. Yes, Merrick agreed, but I'm 30. I'm due. He jerked a loose button from his overcoat and skipped it along the glowing pool, watching the ripples until they stopped. Some would say those pirates went out in a blaze of glory, Cheapshot Charlie offered. More like a dying star, Merrick said. A puff of smoke, and they're gone. Forgotten. Replaced by whatever new sailor decides to turn sour. Is this about your your legacy, Captain? Bloody L said. No, Merrick growled. Legacies are for the living. Why should I care what they say about me when the worms have eaten my ears? No, I'm concerned about more current events. He slid his feet out of the water, and used his greatcoat to dry them. She threw her brooch in the cave. He put his feet back into his boots and stood. I'm going back to get it. Cheapshot Charlie balked. The cave, Captain? Aye. Merrick climbed aboard the jewel, beginning preparations for the voyage. But Captain, Bloody L began. I'm maggot food anyway, aren't I, mates? Merrick burst out. It's only a matter of time before one of Bridgewater's cannons finally hits my melon. I'm already slower than I used to be. I can feel it. Death creeping up on me. He put his hands on the railing. Now, I'm going down into that cave, and I'm going to turn over every piece of eight until I find that brooch. You can help me sail to the tropics, or you can stay here. I don't really care. It won't be easy to man the jewel alone, but it's possible. You really think this will work, Captain? Cheapshot Charlie asked. You think she'll take you back if you bring her the brooch? This isn't about getting her back. The cold shock of this realization sank in. It was true then. She really was gone forever. He shook his head. I'm a wanted man. I can run forever, and I won't put her through that. She deserves better. She deserves... He stopped, clearing his throat of something that had collected there. Some sorrow. I'm the pirate who threw away the greatest treasure he ever got his hands on. The biggest fool to sail the nine seas. And I have to make sure she knows that I know that. 
Make sure she knows I'm sorry before I'm gone. Bloody L climbed aboard the ship. Cheap shot Charlie, however, took a few more seconds of contemplation. You know I would follow you to the ends of the earth, Captain, off the maps entirely. His eyebrows pressed down so hard, they seemed to knit together. Are you sure this is what you want to do? I never should have let her go, Merrick said. Are you sure this is how you want to go? He knew why Cheapshot Charlie asked. The same dilemma had cycled through his mind in the last few days, over and over like a bad sea shanty. To do this went against nature itself, didn't it? Willfully dying instead of waiting for the universe or whoever made such decisions to turn him into fish food? Merrick didn't even pause, without a doubt. A death on his own terms, a death with purpose. Still, Cheapshot Charlie hesitated. You've been with me for a long time, Charlie, Merrick said. Since the beginning, Cheapshot Charlie replied quietly. If this is too far for you, then go. Go now. Captain, Cheapshot Charlie started. You will never be my enemy, Merrick finished, walking to the helm, giving his boatswain space to decide. Within an hour, the jewel cruised across the open sea to a fair clip. Cheapshot Charlie trimmed the mainsail, worry lines wrinkling his bald head as he watched his captain. But his worry was unfounded. Merrick was like a greenie, taking in everything with a fresh eye. The sight of the seabirds dipping their wings into the water, the sun hitting the water, the waves glittering, the marble and the salted meat, the way Bloody Owl's lips disappeared when she concentrated on a knot. The way Cheapshot Charlie watched Bloody L, secret yearning in his eyes that he thought was well hidden. He would miss it, all of it, but not as much as he would miss seeing her smile one last time. Merrick slipped into the turquoise water and swam straight into the cave. He clawed out of the water and took his first breath without fanfare. The air in the cave didn't smell different, didn't taste poisonous but he knew the pollen was all around him, invisible and deadly. A single breath inside the cave and it was already too late. For hours, he searched for the brooch under the watchful gaze of the happy yellow-eyed daisies coating the cavern walls. If the water could hold a pirate's memories in its fluid, otherworldly matter, then each piece of his treasure was a tangible, touchable memory. Each piece jetted him back to where he stole it, whom he stole it from and how it came into his possession. Through coercion, through blood, through trickery, through all three. A chain of rare emeralds taken from a Conchian cocoa ship. A giant golden cross necklace lifted off the priest's barge passing through the channel. Rubies, diamonds, pearls. And it could be tossed straight into a bonfire in hell for all he cared. The brooch. That was the only memory he wanted. And at last he found it. Just as evening crept out of the palm trees on the islands, and the turquoise water became a place of stripes and shadows, he found it. With one last breath of toxic air from the cave, he swam into the open water, brooch in hand, only to be met by the largest, most terrifying mouthful of teeth he had ever seen. A shark, a tank of a fish almost 20 feet long, whipped its tail as it patrolled the mouth of the cave. Merrick reared back in the water and the brooch fell out of his fingers. Frantically, he grasped for it as it sank through the water. But at the very movement of his fingers, the shark charged. Merrick dodged out of the way and then arced his body downward and immediately began pouring his hands through the slimy algae. But the brooch was gone. Frantically, he searched until his lungs were on fire and his brain sent explosive warnings. The animal, to its credit, did not strike. It herded him to the surface, and then left him alone and paced the seafloor near the cave, as if hired to act as guard. When Merrick broke the surface, his mates threw down a rope. Their hearts sank into their stomachs like peach pits. After their captain gasped for air, choking on the sweet purity of oxygen after breathing in the pollen, they expected him to flash a conquering smile. But Merrick's expression was stoic as he climbed into the jewel. I dropped it he said, spitting up seawater. I dropped the brooch. Where is it? I don't know, Merrick blasted. A shark, a huge one. It, it surprised me. I dropped it beneath the reef somewhere. 
He stopped talking and coughed. A small cough, dry and innocent. It could have been his lungs trying to wring more water out of his system. It could have been the chills, or the bends, or the beginning of a nasty cold. But Bloody L and Cheap Shot Charlie knew what that cough meant. They looked at him with wide, unbelieving eyes. Now I have to find that brooch, Merrick said, or I'll be dead for nothing. He coughed again. He didn't stop coughing as he worked on the new plan. Didn't stop coughing when they reached their mark. They anchored the jewel in the gray, stormy bay off Arbilly Island, coughing and coughing and coughing. He was 30 after all. He was due. To explore the offerings of the great ocean, you needn't put yourself through a perilous sea journey or stare into the mouth of a dangerous animal or master the art of deep sea diving. Simply visit a tide pool, count the legs on a starfish, run your fingers along the shell of a mollusk. Watch the way the sea urchin's spines move. Look for the seabirds, the way they dip their wings into the swell. Follow a crab home. Keep your eyes open, always, and the marvels of the ocean will be there, waiting. The sea is always welcome to those who don't mind getting a bit of brine and adventure on their sleeves. Exploring an Underwater Fairyland by Dr. and Dr. Quail. Chapter 27. A Thunderclap. Fidelia awoke in the darkened, dampened dawn. She waited for the pelting of rain on the loft window, but heard nothing. She let her eyelids flutter shut, disregarding the noise as a dream. The room was silent, the couch warm, and she snoozed. Another thunderclap. Fidelia rolled off the couch and stumbled to the loft window. The streets were mist-shrouded, the sky hazy and purple in that perplexing time that was both moonless and sunless. It wasn't a thunderclap, she realized. It was the Navy's cannon, the naval base. Tomorrow at dawn. That's what Admiral Bridgewater had said. And now tomorrow is today. The Navy sounded its cannons for all public hangings. The first cannon fired when the noose was strung. The second cannon when the convicted dangled. The third cannon blast meant he had ceased his kicking and was gone. Two cannons fired. Merrick, right now, hung from the gallows, noose tight, face red, purple veins bulging. Fidelia held her breath. The third cannon came. Fidelia bit down on her fist, trying to rid her mind of the image of Merrick's lifeless body twisting in the morning breeze. What about the brooch? The brooch he'd given his life for. Had the Admiral found it in Merrick's final moments and tossed it in the garbage? Or had Merrick managed to stash it somewhere? Did he pitch it back into the sea before they hanged him, where the salt water might eventually finish it off, eating the pewter until it became brine? She heard a noise in the other room. Padding around the corner, she found Aunt Julia sitting up in bed, staring out her own window with tears streaming. Aunt Julia? Fidelia asked, her voice creaky with sleep. Why was her aunt crying? Happy tears because Fidelia had returned home? Sad tears because Ida and Arthur had not? Are you all right, darling? What is it? Aunt Julia discreetly wiped her cheeks. Bad dream, Fidelia lied, but I'll try to forget it. She went back to the couch, but sleep eluded her. Stony Beach was a wasteland of wood splinters and broken shells. Jute bags lost from cocoa ships and torn apart in the storm and the sun-bleached bones of a sea creature. A kitchen sink, of all things, had washed ashore, its porcelain already decorated with, with acorn barnacles. Kelp was everywhere, dried, clinging to the rocks. Low tide brought a fishy sulfur stench to the beach, but Fidelia breathed it in as if it were her first taste of air. Her heart pitter-pattered. Ocean as far as she could see, the shift of pebbles to coarse sand to foam beneath her boots. Some things, at least, never changed. She flipped open her observation book before the tears came and traced a finger along the outline of Grizzle's sketched tail. Sickle-shaped, a tail built for power, for speed, a sweeping tail that made the whole ocean shudder. Fidelia shut her observation book and looked around. It was midday. The bay wrinkled in the beginning wisps of a storm. Waves kissed the harbor and retreated swelling higher every second. Old thunderstorms blew away. Fresh rain moved in. The windows of all the buildings turned into mirrors, making the whole city feel like the inside of a cumulonimbus cloud. 
She hadn't been able to save her parents. She hadn't been able to save Merrick. But maybe, if she hurried, she could save herself. If you have something important to do, Merrick had growled to her in Medusa's grotto, while the starfish ate the barnacle decorating the jewel's hull. You do it now. Inside the library, Fidelia found Aunt Julia stamping catalog cards for a few new atlases. Aunt Julia, can we talk? Aunt Julia considered her niece, then nodded. Let's go upstairs. I'll put the kettle on. In the loft, she brought two cups of tea and sat across from Fidelia, quietly waiting at the little green table. Taking a deep breath, Fidelia opened her observation book to the sketch of Grizzle, then pushed it toward her aunt. On the night that Mom and Dad died, she said, noting that she had managed to say the word without flinching or hollowing out. This shark swam into the bay. I was so close to tagging it, but then the undertow hit, and... Aunt Julia reached out a hand, gripping Fidelia's chilly fingers. He's out there still, Fidelia said, puttering around the tropics, untagged. And if I don't track him down or tag him, someone else might. Aunt Julia sipped her tea. I know you feel like this is my parents' work, Fidelia said, and that I'm just a girl, but... Aunt Julia shook her head. No, Fidelia, I was wrong. She took a deep breath. You are not just a girl. You are a quail, and I can't think of anyone better to continue with the quail family research. She traced a finger along the floral print of her teacup. I've never been the bravest person in the room. The quiet of books, that's what I've always preferred. Aunt Julia pushed her round glasses higher on her nose, and it cost me dearly in the past. It cost me, she cleared her throat. I think I could learn a lot from you, Fidelia, if you would be willing to show me. Fidelia came around the table and gave her aunt a hug. They would be so proud of you, Aunt Julia whispered into Fidelia's hair. Fidelia felt a tingle of warmth trail down her spine. Now then, Aunt Julia said, turning her attention back to the observation book. Tell me more about this fish. Fidelia spent the rest of the day in the library, drawing maps and making plans for a spring trip to the tropics. Aunt Julia promised they could leave as soon as the undertow ran its course, and so Fidelia wrote a to-do checklist. Fix the platypus, replicate the water eater, reorder a few essential supplies, while Aunt Julia hunted through the archives for any mention of shark migration patterns. It almost felt like a normal day, a day from before, before her journey with the pirates, and before losing her parents. Fidelia ran her fingers along the out line of Grizzle's powerful tail, and the old fizzle and whisper of adventure charged down her back like a current. This was really going to happen. She was finally going to put a tag on Grizzle's fin and give him his scientific name. So it settled. Aunt Julia closed her ledger at five o'clock, the ink smudged on her forehead. The day after the undertow blows out of town, so do we, and we don't stop until we find the shark, Fidelia said, her insides full of shooting stars. Aunt Julia blew a gust of air out of her mouth and grinned at her niece. I'm famished. What do you think about going out for dinner? Maybe La Fruits de Mer? La Fruits de Mer? Fidelia repeated. It was the fanciest restaurant in Arborly. Fidelia had been there only a handful of times with her parents, usually to celebrate a university grant or a major research breakthrough. Aunt Julia took their empty teacups to the sink and rinsed them out. I think we deserve a gourmet meal. Salmon cakes to start, I think, and lobster bisque, and the lemongrass mussels. Fidelia's stomach growled. Sounds perfect. She glanced down at her plain blue frock. Brown tea dribbled on the collar. I'll go change. Oh, Aunt Julia dashed into her bedroom. Fidelia followed. Her aunt dug around in the very back of her closet. Ah, here it is. She turned, holding out a lovely pale lilac high-necked sheath dress with a sheer lace bib ivory lace trim, and ribbon on the cap sleeves. A pair of lilac lace fingerless gloves were draped over the hanger, as well as an ivory sash. Was it mom's? Fidelia breathed, gliding her fingers along the fabric. No, Aunt Julia said. I wore this to your parents' wedding. Fidelia was shocked. Her Aunt Julia had once worn this? This dress that barely had sleeves? She couldn't picture her aunt in anything so stylish. She let Aunt Julia fasten her into the dress, and together they looked in the full-length mirror. It was like looking at Ida Quayle herself. 
Was it the evening light, softening Fidelia's usually angular nose and jawline? Was it the way the dress lengthened her neck, making it elegant instead of scrawny and pencil-like? Even her hair seemed less scraggly once Aunt Julia pinned it up over her right ear. You look so much like her, Aunt Julia whispered. So do you, Fidelia said, and meant it. Julia was ten years younger than her big sister, but shared the same gray eyes, the same closed-mouthed smile, the slight gap in her front teeth. Now, what about you? Are you going to get ready? Aunt Julia looked down at her clothing. I am ready. Fidelia stared. Aunt Julia was in her typical librarian uniform, a modest ankle-length gray skirt, sensible flats, and a starched and pressed button-up cream shirt. A gray chiffon scarf was tied around her neck to cover the last remaining inch of skin. Oh, all right, Aunt Julia said. I suppose I could change things up. She removed her scarf and reached for a slightly different scarf, chartreuse green, hanging from a hook in her closet. Wait. Fidelia caught a glimpse of something on her aunt's neck and leaned over to inspect it. It was a violet scar, prominently dark against the rest of Julia's porcelain-smooth skin. A jellyfish scar, Fidelia whispered. If she hadn't already recognized the scar from her childhood with marine biologist parents, she could have matched her aunt's scar with the one on her shin. Fidelia's was fresh and still raw, yes, but they were otherwise identical. From, from when I was younger, the green scarf went around Aunt Julia's neck, tied with an extra knot. Shall we? Fidelia nodded and was still nodding when Aunt Julia slipped down the stairs, the impression of the scar's outline etched in her mind like a lightning strike. It's kind of a weird place to end today, but that is where we are ending Race to the Bottom of the Sea. We will be back with one more episode um, in the next couple of days, so stay tuned for that, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!